Welcome back to part three of our podcast mini-series on the Kwangju Uprising in South Korea in 1980. If you haven't heard them already, I'd go back and listen to parts one and two first. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that this podcast is only made possible because of support from you, our listeners, on Patreon. So if you can, please consider supporting us today. In return, you get access to exclusive benefits, including access to an exclusive bonus episode about the uprising, where we include some additional information from our interviewees which we couldn't fit into these main episodes. Learn more and sign up at patreon.com slash working class history. Link in the show notes. As a content note, there is a brief mention of sexual violence towards the end of this episode. By the end of part two, the 22nd of May, the workers and residents of Kwangju had risen up and liberated the city from the murderous paratroopers of US-backed dictator Chun Du Wan. The uprising also spread to several nearby towns including Naju, Mokpo, Hwasun, Hampyong, Yongwang, Muan, Hainam and Gangjin. Kwangju was free, but there was a big shadow hanging over it. As Chen Yong Ho explains. Well, technically, there was a kind of freedom, but it was like a type of freedom you feel before death. It's a nervous sense of peace before the impending doom, like the calm before the storm. It was more of a nervousness than freedom. Kim Yong Ho, meanwhile, had been taken into a house by local residents who helped him recover from getting shot by the soldiers. I was treated for gunshot wounds, and with my mind full of anger, I went back to provincial office. After a visit to the hospital, Kim then decided to try to join the citizens militia which had been established to fight the paratroopers, and was headquartered in the provincial office. Some men who was in the hospital shouting, If anyone can walk, let's go out and fight. I must have followed his message that all our citizens are dying, our families are dying. Everyone who can stand up and walk, we must go to the provincial office. Thinking about why I must have followed him, as I mentioned earlier, I did not know why it happened. I just had no clue. I just happened to be watching a demonstration and found it fun. And it all just happened to me. That is why I felt that it was a war. I have four siblings, and my father was living in an island called Wando. I thought I should protect my mother and siblings. I thought I had to fight with the gun to protect them. So I went to the provincial office and asked for a gun. But the civilian army would never give me a gun. The reason why they never gave me a gun was that they never gave it to anyone who didn't have any military training. Yes, they only gave guns to the people who had military training, so instead the work that I was given was to disinfect the bodies when they came in. Cleaning the deceased. In Korean, it's called yum. I put cotton in alcohol, wiped the blood, or... Put alcohol cotton into the bullet hole. Kapsu Sol, researcher and lead translator of the book Kwangju Diary, explains that within the uprising, two main factions emerged based on their strategy for how to proceed. Like many other uprisings, during the course of the uprising, there are three major groups emerged. One is like ordinary people, they have a leader idea what to do about uprising, but they want to no, and that they want to follow if there's some direction. And the one direction given by a major political figure in Gwangju was just negotiate with the military. And that's, to be honest, to negotiate the uh, term of surrender. Uh, the other group was, was a small group led by uh, Yun Sang Won, who was a former student leader. Then he had a uh, he had, he had a nice call 
Tupul Wildfire. That group tried to organize people into strong resistance against the military and the wait until other city rising up. So there's a big tension between this uh, uh, soft liner and the hard liner of the future of Gwangju. The moderate faction who wanted to surrender swiftly set up a body called the Citizen Settlement Committee, based out of the provincial office. They put together some demands, like amnesty for all protesters, and began trying to negotiate with the government. David Dollinger, a Peace Corps volunteer, had access to the provincial office and was an eyewitness to some of the discussions taking place. When the troops had first left the city, the groups that was really initially controlling and negotiating with the military were a lot older. So it was a lot of the established clergy, elderly businessmen, you know, sort of the respected elders. Um, Part of the problem you had is with the younger generation, the students, the the young uh, blue collar workers is that group just wanted to sort of acquiesce to the military and just try to get back to normal as quickly as possible. And the young did not see that as a path forward because they knew that they would, you know, a lot of them would be arrested. They would have no amnesty for anything that they did. So there was fighting really internally in some ways and, or debate let's, that way. So at one point, the entire um, sort of citizens committee changed really into a, as I called it, the student uh, committee and the young workers committee. And that even changed because within those, there were um, groups that were more um, opposed to just giving in to the military and those that still wanted to sort of just meet all the military's demands and have this sort of come to an end and and just everything go back to normal. Despite the fact that the hardliners and others wanted to continue the uprising, the more respectable business people and moderates of the Citizen Settlement Committee started negotiating with the government and also began acting on their own to undermine the rebels by collecting weapons and hand them over to the military. They were collecting arms, so they weren't just saying, everybody just keep whatever you've confiscated. They were bringing back all the arms that uh, citizens had uh, taken during the uh, the previous days, because this is one of the demands the military had. But there was, as a whole setup, it, it changed quite fluidly. The settlement committee managed to gather up thousands of weapons and give them back to the government. They had managed to disarm a number of students, but they had less luck confiscating the weapons of workers and the city's so-called underclass. At the same time, police, army and intelligence agencies attempted to infiltrate the provincial office to sabotage the movement from within. The rebels quickly reacted to this, setting up their own intelligence service to try to combat it, issuing passes to authorised individuals for their headquarters. But despite some successes in expelling saboteurs, government agents were able to cause significant problems. For example, they managed to get access to the rebels' stockpile of dynamite and detonators, and deactivate them without the rebels' knowledge. Meanwhile, on the 22nd of May, South Korean and US officials met, and the US approved a plan to give up control of some South Korean troops to allow them to be used to suppress the uprising in Gwangju. The following day, 23rd of May, some battles were still taking place, as militia tried to dislodge paratroopers from some areas outside the city, like the Kwangju Penitentiary, and the paratroopers would launch minor incursions to test the city's defences, during which they continued to murder and mutilate unarmed civilians. The general plan by the government at this stage was to wait. Military kind of wait for the uprising to peter itself for a while. they think Gwangju going to be mired into some kind of confusion or chaos because there's no, there's no order, there's no police. The Gwangju people govern city very successfully for themselves. There's no major crime over the five days of uprising. There's no looting. There's no hoarding. Then... That prompted military strike back very fast. 
Throughout the period of the Kwangju Commune, workers and residents would continue to meet en masse around the fountain outside the provincial hall to hear reports from various committees and occasionally government representatives and collectively make decisions. A major task undertaken by the rebels was cataloguing details of all those killed and injured, organising funerals and collecting money to aid the families of the victims. On the 24th of May, the government announced that it would give amnesty to anyone who surrendered their weapons, trying to weaken the resolve of the militia. The settlement committee reported back on its negotiations to a mass assembly, and it was pretty clear to most people that they weren't getting any concessions from the government at all, which swung more public support behind the hardliners, who wanted to fight to the end. And in a meeting of the committee and the student committee later that evening, things came to a head. I was actually lucky enough to be in one of the uh, one of the internal meetings, so I was actually brought in by the, the one person that befriended me, and I sat there through the entire meeting as they sort of argued with one another. And the meeting I was in was the initial beginnings of the argument among the young ones between you know, sort of the passive versus those that were like, "Look, if we give up all of our weapons, we have no leverage." We have nothing. They're just, they will just come in and that will be it. And we will have you know, fought back against the brutality for nothing. While it was clear that most of the settlement committee just wanted to surrender, the hardliners pushed back. Some committee members just resigned, and the student committee, acknowledging the uprising had gone well beyond the student movement, added a number of worker representatives. The workers were adamant they didn't want to give up their weapons. Because if they did this without achieving any concessions, then all of those who'd fallen in battle would have done so in vain. By the end of that Saturday night, the hardliners had the upper hand. Some of the people who have to organize um, rising, ordinary people, began to support Yun Sang-won's group. And they are there, like 200 or 300 people who formed last defense on the last day of um, rising. Um, after 30 years or 40 years, it's hard to tell who was right or who was wrong. Maybe you need to surrender to prevent further bloodshed. Maybe you should fight to the right last until other region rise you up. That's a tough call, but Gwangju people decide to side with uh, Yun sang and others and the fight to last. At that point in time, we were starting to almost get, you know, hourly reports that the troops were, were attacked, or they were encircling and the Kwangju you know, even tighter, they were making the news tighter. So actually I stayed that night and manned the military radio because they thought perhaps the, uh, the troops would be using English uh, to, to send commands around. So I actually was asked by the leaders to, to stay in man the, the radio, which I did. But starting really Saturday night, Sunday, they knew it was starting to come to an end because I was talking with a lot of the people there. And there were some that were, you could say that they were frightened. There were others that were like, you know, if I give up my life, and, but this makes a difference, I'm willing to sacrifice myself. And what was interesting, really, from that standpoint, uh, some of the central leadership actually tried to get as many people out of the provincial office building on Monday night because they knew, I think they knew deep down, that is the the Monday night, Tuesday morning was when we could kill them. So they really wanted to minimize the number of people that died. But there was a, a strong group that was willing to sacrifice themselves because they thought that they really had to go out and fight. That that was the only way that the point would be made. That people are willing to, to sacrifice themselves for the greater good of Korea, but for democracy in Korea. And that they were able to make that stand that maybe the world would start to put pressure on Korea. It's one of the things that you know I haven't even touched upon here is that because of that time with Carter being president 
and basing his administration on human rights, the people of Guangzhou thought the U.S. would intercede and would negotiate a peaceful outcome. But by Sunday, they knew that that was no longer going to happen. The groups that were, were running Guangzhou were constantly asking themselves, the Peace Corps volunteers, as well as the reporters, make sure the U.S. Embassy knows what's going on. We want them to come in and help intercede and negotiate so we can have a peaceful outcome. By Sunday, they knew that was going to happen. And that was really, I think, the turning point when I was talking to people was that Sunday when they finally came to that realization that this was not going to be an easy settlement to this, this sort of um, uprising or whatever terminology you, you want to get it. Because the only reason it's called an uprising is because in Korean, sate, which is the original term for the quantity, it's called the quantity sate means uprising, but it means a lot more than that. Just as, a, as an offshoot there. David came to realise that US government talk of human rights was just that, talk. Human rights only matters when there's no capitalism involved. Chen Yong Ho had also heard of the US fleet movements, but didn't hold the same illusions as many in Guangzhou. 보면은... The Americans had an army of submarines and an air force, and they moved it. We learned that the U.S. had made some movements with their fleet, but they only did that because of the fear of potential raiding from North Korea. We knew about the Americans' movements, but the average civilians didn't know any better. They thought that the Americans were there to help, but we knew that it wasn't the case. They were only concerned about North Korea. It was more of a performative move to bring some false idea of protection or care from the U.S. Michael Choi, who interviewed Chun for us, asked him if the U.S. government did anything at all to assist the residents of Guangzhou during the events. You think the U.S. would ever do such a thing, come to help us? They just pretended like nothing was happening. They just figured we'd take care of ourselves. By the next day, Sunday the 25th of May, March of Kwangchu was back up and running almost normally, albeit with the hospitals still overloaded with the wounded and dying. With the militia determined to fight on, the settlement committee also gave up on trying to gather more weapons to surrender. The student settlement committee decided to surrender and vacate the provincial office, and by the end of the day, the hardliners took it over. The official leadership of the rebellion now had a much more working class and an activist basis than before. There was many students left the city. And uh, I, I had a good conversation with this uh, wife of Reverend Huntry many years ago. She told me how many, he had many students escape from the city with his, uh, with his car. Yeah. But those who who hold the ground at the last moment at, in the province were, they are mainly workers, what we call precarious worker, maybe gig worker today, who hold the ground to fight to the last. It was a big shock to middle class kid. Because as a kid, I was, I would have to share the hatred for working class. I was told not to respect them. Right? <laughs> but the only respect of people during the Amrajee was ordinary workers. And probably Yun Sang Won, because uh, without him, there will be no last fight. But you, what makes Yun Sang Won stand out among other activists is that his orientation toward the working class. He gave up job in Seoul at bank and came down and returned to his hometown, Gwangju, to organize workers. Not organized people, but organized workers. And he ran night school for workers, wide fire. That's a very unusual orientation for his generation. The balance of forces remained pretty much the same throughout the next day, Monday the 26th of May, with two clear sides lined up against one another. The residents of Kwangju, who were determined not to surrender, 
and the military, who were determined to crush them. Government efforts to destabilise and undermine the uprising from within had failed to have much impact, so they decided to launch an all-out invasion. It eventually came in the early hours of Tuesday, the 27th of May. They mobilized two army divisions and three paratrooper corps to raid the province hall, kill many people who formed last defense. One of them was Yun Sang Wan. The 24th Special Forces Group came early at dawn. You see, in order to move the Air Force, there need not be any official approval. But to move civilians, there must be some kind of official approval. But the 24th Special Forces Group, on October 20th, 1979, when President Jung Hee Park died, there was a potential threat from North Korea, so they received this approval. They used that as an excuse to approve the dispatch of the Special Forces Group to move us civilians. So the 24th Special Forces Group, they continued to fight. There were over 10,000 of them, the soldiers. But the civilian soldiers, they were just two or 300 young people. Some with guns, but just young kids, you know. Probably about half or a third of them were middle school students. They don't know how to shoot guns. And against them were 10,000 trained, armed soldiers. What kind of fight would that be? But they came to fight, and it was merciless. Tim's house where we were staying was uh, at the near the train station. So we were actually woken up at about 3.30. We started to hear some gunfire. We also heard on a PA system pleading um, by a woman for the citizens of Kwangju to get up to come to the provincial office buildings. Uh, because the troops were coming. And I gotta say, that was one of the most painful things I've ever heard. Like, in essence, you really heard just really want people to come so that this won't have been in vain. Uh, to the point where actually I had initially made the decision I was going to go. And you stopped by King. Yeah, it was a, a, a good way, right? It wasn't <laughs> in a bad way. Um, but, you know, my plan was actually to go down to the provincial office buildings and sit in front of it in the big closet and sit front. I'm like, they're not going to kill me, I hope. Um, maybe I can keep the blood so from that. But by that point in time, when I already started to make that decision, you could hear the gunfire occur around us. And what was sad about it is you could hear these rapid fire, and that's just the M16s. Uh, sometimes it actually sounds like machine guns that would then be sort of answered by a pop, 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 which was the, the, uh, the citizens, the people in the provincial office building firing back with their antiquated M1s which were a rifle from, you know, World War II vintage. And that's really what you sort of heard. And then you would hear, hear the rumbling of the tanks as they, they came down the streets. That morning I was out of the house in about 8.30 and was able to get, go to the provincial office buildings. I was able to get inside where I saw the devastation that occurred. You know, on the front of the building, just looking in it, you could see that, that at some point machine guns had been utilized because some of the uh, stucco on the outside of the building was just destroyed. Windows were just totally, um, had just been totally blown out. As I was walking around, you could see the points where it looked like hand grenades had been uh, thrown. There had been fires. When I was there, and I wasn't able to go through the entire building, I covered at least uh, 10 miles, just in the provincial office building. As I then walked the streets around the provincial office buildings, I saw uh, I was about another eight. And what was sad is there were people I saw I knew. That, you know, 
that had died in the prison to love. Kim Yong-ho had been at the provincial office the previous night, but was sent on an errand, which probably ended up saving his life. In the evening of the 26th of May, a doctor asked me to run an errand because my house was nearby. He said, go home and get some salt. Salt was a very precious thing at the time because everything was blocked banned, so the citizens all together made rice balls and ate them only with salt. In a way, the only side dish we had was salt. So it was very, very important. So I just went home to get it, but my mother caught me and I couldn't get out of my house ever since. As a grown-up, now I am aware that the civilian army knew that the martial law army was coming down at dawn on 27th to take over the provincial office. Then, Yun Sang-won, a representative temporary spokesman, sent teenagers and young people back to their homes. The reason why, he said, we need someone to testify about this historical event, so you all should go back and testify about this history. And we will stay here and write a history alive till the very end. Maybe the doctor who sent me on an errand, I think he didn't actually ask me to do a salt errand, because I wouldn't have gone home if he sent me. Yeah, I wouldn't have gone home. That's why he sent me on an errand to save me. And as he wished, I was caught by my mother and locked up in a church tower called Dongmyeong Church and spent the night of the 27th there. That's the May 18th I remember, I experienced. This young child, as a very ordinary teenager, I took May 18th as a war, and my idea was that I must fight against to protect my brothers and sisters, and my mother, yes. This is how I remember those moments. Before dawn on the 27th of May, the military launched final assaults on the last rebel holdouts. Chun Yong-ho was at the Young Women's Christian Association, YWCA, which was also used as a key organising location by activists during the uprising. The YWCA in front of the provincial office was our headquarters for us, the public relations or marketing teams. It was where the wildfire evening school and other orgs and teams came to use the space. And we weren't soldiers. We were just sharing news and information. There was an emergency alert at three in the morning in our building. So, you know, we had to pick up our guns and fight. We pushed the female students out to escape out the back door. And there were about 30 of us men. We only had 10 guns. A few of us went to go get more arms. I didn't know at the time, but the soldiers were just about to break through. The fires were getting bigger and bigger. So we couldn't move until it's 7 or 8 in the morning. I felt like I had narrowly escaped my death. Some of Chun's friends weren't so fortunate. Yes, there was a lot of hurt and pain for us at the Wildfire Night School team. There was a female colleague of mine and Park Young Jun also. For us, it almost felt like an inevitability. In that encounter, they were shot to death. So in total, we had two members murdered on the wildfire night school team. At the provincial office, Yoon Sang-won held hands with his comrades, Kim Yong-chol and Yi Yang-hyun, and said to each other, we will meet again in the next world. The military attacked just after 4 a.m., Massively outnumbered and outgunned, the rebels fought as long as they could. Most of them were killed, but a handful on each floor ran out of ammunition and surrendered so they could try to tell the tale of what happened one day to the world. Some of those survivors were murdered. All of them were viciously beaten, then arrested. By a little after 5am, the military takeover was complete and the uprising was over. Then, government forces began to take their revenge trying to round up and arrest anyone who had anything to do with the rebellion. 
That last night, and the decision the remaining rebels had to make, is something Katsu Soul thinks about a lot. When I have a tough decision, I try to put myself in that last moment in the province or if I was in province or in the last day of the Amrai, what should I do? Then nothing is that tough because there's one solution to very typical situation. And then that's how I usually use the inspiration I got from Amrai through my life. With the South Korean dictatorship now firmly back in control, many surviving participants went into hiding, including Jun Yong Ho. We snuck to my older sister's house, which was about five minutes away. We hid there for three days, and after that, we escaped to Seoul. And now we were wanted. My father was a civil servant, you see, a government employee. So they threatened him there that if his son didn't turn himself in, my father, he would have to resign. So I turned myself in. Thousands of people were arrested in the aftermath of the uprising. They were all brutally tortured. I turned myself in and was arrested immediately. They interrogated me and they investigated me. I was sent to trial and then they threw me in prison. I was in prison for about 20 days. Other members of the Wildfire Night School were arrested too. We also had two members arrested. Kim Hyung-chol, he was arrested. The next day, he was trying to commit suicide and beat his own head. We took him to the hospital, but the medical care he got was subpar. They just put basic bandages on. So when he got out, there was an infection. The infection grew and his brain and mental health was quite affected. He was in and out of mental health facilities and hospitals. And in 98, he passed away. And Miss Park, she was also put on the wanted list. At the time, there were about 10 of us on the wildfire night school team who were on the wanted list. Eventually, she was arrested and imprisoned. She went on a hunger strike and passed away in prison. By the end of the uprising, the official death toll recognised by the South Korean government was 193, but they later agreed to pay compensation to 288 people. The true number may be considerably higher, as martial law forces were seen trying to hide bodies in various places, like burying them in forests. Even in late 2019, a mass grave was discovered by Kwangju Penitentiary, which might contain up to 250 bodies. DNA tests are currently being run to try to identify the remains. In general, though, estimates of those killed range from 200 up to 2,000. In May 2018, a woman came forward and stated that she'd been raped by soldiers in the repression of the uprising. A subsequent government investigation confirmed at least 17 cases of sexual assault, including against teenage girls and at least one pregnant woman. Given the stigma associated with sexual assault and the difficulties for survivors in coming forwards, the true numbers here are also likely much higher. On top of this, you've also got to consider the hundreds or thousands of people injured, as well as those arrested, tortured and imprisoned. These were just people fighting for basic civil liberties, democratic rights and workers' rights, things which Western countries like the US and UK supposedly support. So now it's worth discussing something we mentioned right at the beginning of this mini-series how little known this uprising is. In South Korea itself, under the dictatorship, mention of the uprising was forbidden. The book telling its story, Kwangju Diary, translated by Kapsu Sol, was banned, as was the song about it, used as the theme tune for these episodes. Outside Korea, the Kwangju uprising is very little known. I know when I've mentioned it to people in the UK or the US, the only people who've heard of it before have been Korean. Now, of course, in the UK and US, there's not the same kind of state censorship as in a military dictatorship. But as British socialist author George Orwell wrote of the UK, quote, Unpopular ideas can be silenced without the need for any official ban. It's not exactly forbidden to say this, that or the other, but it is not done to say it. End quote. So while talking about the Kwangju uprising was never banned, it's simply, quote, not done to talk about it. So, for example, a search of the BBC website gives three results for terms related to the Kwangju uprising. Whereas if you search for articles about the Tiananmen Square protests in China in 1989, there are nearly 300 results. 
In reality, these protests in China weren't just in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, but took place in cities across the country, but we're going to use this commonly understood term to refer to them. And on CNN.com, similar searches give one result for an article which briefly mentions the Kuangju uprising, an article which contains significant factual errors as it happens, whereas again, searching for articles about the Tiananmen Square protests gives nearly 200 results. So here we have two comparable events. Both were large protest movements calling, in varying degrees, for improved workers and democratic rights. Both involved fierce fighting with government forces, and both involved similar death tolls. The South Korean government acknowledging around 200 dead, with activists claiming up to 2,000, and with Tiananmen, the Chinese government acknowledging around 300 dead, with activists claiming around three to 4,000. So why the difference in media coverage between the two events? Well, of course, it could just be coincidence, but given that this same pattern pretty much occurs with any other comparable events, we believe that geopolitics is the answer. While China is a political rival of the West in many respects, South Korea is a close ally, and their dictatorship was fully propped up by the United States and their supposedly friendly, human rights-driven foreign policy, although US involvement in the actual massacres in Gwangju isn't as clear as some believe. As a student in South Korea and in college student, I believe that the U.S. involvement was more direct or straightforward. I basically believe that the U.S. ordered John Doan kill Gwangju people, but things did not work out that way. It was more complex. However, at least U.S. intelligence community, I hate that word, the intelligence community, but U.S. intelligence community, U.S. intelligence agency began to support John Doan very early when John Doan seized control of the military in, in December. Two days later, at CIA's urging, U.S. Ambassador Greistin met with uh, John Doan at his residence. Just think about that. U.S. Ambassador, who represents U.S. government in South Korea, met with a general who just killed a bunch of uh, his failure. That's a clear sign of U.S. approval then. And the John Doan, as I told you, he was trained in psychological warfare. When he met with uh, Greistin, he accompanied by two truckloads of security guard. And the right across the U.S. Ambassador residence, there's a Korea Times, there's a Yonam News Agency. He wants to show that he has US, U.S. support to news agencies so that rumor have to spread about their meeting. And uh, after the meeting, James Young was a military attaché to South Korea. And he got many phone calls from South Korean journalists and the politicians about the meeting between the Christ and John Duan. And uh, they asked, U.S. decide to support John Duan at any cost whatsoever. So John Duan make people believe that he has a blank check from U.S. And he was a blank check. And uh, Christine was kind, obviously he was racist. He was very condescending about Korea. The way he talked to opposition leader, it's like uh, he talked to his one children or his grandson, he already preached about democracy, preached about political stability and so on. But that's some sort of U.S. position towards John Duan or South Korean people. South Co- U.S. believe that South Korea was not ready to take on democracy. They believe that they, South Korea needs a strong general like John Duan to keep things in order. And the John Doan was kind of, uh, he believed that he was kind of a beauty contest. <laughs> that he had to show, to hold the power in South Korea, he had to show his solu- resolution, his strength, his power to U.S. official, which he did. So if you genuinely think that the role of media organizations is to report news fairly and accurately, then this discrepancy between coverage of Kwang Chu and Tiananmen Square is hard to explain. But we think that most listeners to this show would realise that a major role of media organisations in capitalist societies is to advance the interests of the capitalist governments or corporations who own them. 
So if this is the case, then it makes perfect sense to hush up stories where their own corporations, ideologies or governments are implicated, and make a big splash about ones where rival corporations, governments or ideologies are implicated. It also makes sense to cover the events differently. So even though a primary factor motivating working class involvement in the Tiananmen Square protests was pro-market reforms implemented by the government which hurt working class living standards, but benefited the corporations, this is almost never mentioned. Instead, the protests are painted as protests against communism or socialism because the Chinese government calls itself communist. Conversely, events like the Guangzhou uprising are normally not even spoken about, but when they are, they're never referred to as protests against capitalism, even though the South Korean government and its back of the US are as capitalist as can be. That's it for part three of this mini-series. Next time, we speak with our interviewees about the aftermath of the uprising, its legacy, its contested history, and what it means to them today. Our Patreon supporters can listen to this, as well as an exclusive bonus episode right now. If you don't support us yet, you can do so from as little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. If you can't spare the cash, no worries at all, but please do tell your friends about our podcast, and give us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. We would like to say thanks again to all of our guests for speaking with us, as well as Michael Choi for undertaking interviews in Guangzhou, and Angela Lee, Jiminy Lee and the Hung Coalition, who helped with translation and dubbing, as well as Rachel Min Park, who helped connect us with people. Massive thanks, as always, to our Patreon supporters who make this podcast possible, and special thanks to Connor Kanatsi, Shay, James and Ariel Joya. Theme music for this episode was Marching for the Beloved, about the Kwangju Uprising, by Baek Ki Won, Wang Suk Young, and Kim Jong Ryul. Link to stream it in the show notes. Thanks to Jesse French for editing this episode, and last but not least, thanks to you for listening. Catch you next time.